going to talk now about the Civil War in our own county. And we're going to look at what Ellis County was like back during this time. We're going to look at uh, what the people did during the Civil War. And we're going to look at what happened to the county and to the people in the county. Ellis County, I would say, is a microcosm of the Deep South. Now, if you're not familiar with that term, microcosm, it means it's a little bitty example that really has all the facets of the big picture, all the facets of the South. So you look at Ellis County, and you pretty much can understand what is typical throughout the South at that time. Eli Whitney, in 1793, is going to make an invention Whitney's going to invent the cotton gin. Now, the cotton gin is simply a way to separate the fibers from the seeds of cotton. When I was a kid, we lived in this North Texas area. I lived out in the country. Uh, wasn't a, we weren't a farm family, but there were farms all around us, and uh, they grew cotton on these farms. And I remember when cotton was ripe, which is about, oh, September or so, I'd go out there as a little kid and I would pull a little bit of the cotton. And the thing about the cotton that we can grow in the American South is that the seeds are right in the fiber and they're in there really tight. I mean, it's like somebody glued them into the fiber. And of course, I'd like to have a, a handful of soft cotton but there were these hard seeds in there, kind of like lemon seeds, seeds in a lemon or in an orange. So I'd try to pull them out, and it was a lot of work just to, just to get the seeds out of one little handful of cotton. Well, prior to the invention of the cotton gin in 1793, people basically, if they grew cotton in the South, they had to pull the seeds out by hand. Now, typically, of course, they'd have a slave doing that. But the thing was, they could not uh, profitably produce cotton because of this, this processing delay that it took. It took too much time to process the cotton. So nobody grew cotton very much in the South until after the time of the cotton gin. Now, this made cotton production profitable. And another thing you need to understand about cotton production is that it takes a lot of labor. Okay, it takes a lot of tending to the cotton. And this would be done, of course, by slaves. And so when cotton was, was uh, starting to be produced on a larger scale, this basically ramped up the need for slaves on those areas, where, on those lands where cotton was going to be produced. So the invention of the cotton gin is going to lead to the vast increase of cotton growing in the American South, and that's going to lead to an increase in slavery in the American South. Before this time, it was pretty much thought, like when we wrote the Constitution, for example, that slavery was going to die a natural death. It, it was just going to slowly fade away because the need for slaves seemed to be less and less. But the cotton gin changed all that. So... We're going to be looking at uh, a town in the south like Ellis County, and we're going to find that it is going to have a cotton gin. In fact, Ellis County had three cotton gins throughout the uh, area. and In fact, Waxahachie itself actually had three. And we find that this, like a large part of the lower south, a large part of the deep south, this was perfect land for cotton. If you go out here, what color is the dirt? Yeah, it's black. Now, this black soil is alluvial soil, they call it, and it is very, very rich, and it is ideal for growing cotton. So, basically, the people who own the farmland in Ellis County, the people who own the farmland all through the Lower South are sitting on a potential gold mine. But what they have to do is they have to have lots of labor to grow the cotton that is going to make them a lot of money. If you can look at this map, I think this will show things um, in a little better perspective. 
Each of those dots indicates 2,000 bales of cotton being produced in the year 1860. Now you notice where these dots are uh, heavily concentrated in Alabama, in Mississippi, and in the eastern side of Louisiana, but you do notice they extend all the way over into Texas. And this entire area that's covered with the, the dots is considered the, the deep south, or sometimes it's called the lower south. And cotton had spread all the way from Georgia and the Carolinas, over there on the right, to Texas and uh, up into Arkansas by the time that uh, 1860 rolled around, the eve of the Civil War. This is a vast belt of rich soil, and it's going to, again, just, just prompt the growth of slavery all through this area. The uh, slaves originally in the United States had been up in kind of the upper right-hand corner of the map in the Virginia, Maryland area. What did, they, what did they cultivate up there? What was the big cash crop up there? Tobacco, Tobacco right. Now that had limited value. A lot of the slaves in those areas, by the time that cotton became very popular and profitable, were actually sold into the lower south. Now you may have heard the term before uh, to sell somebody down the river. Well, that is something that refers to people uh, selling slaves from those northern areas, the, not really the north, but the upper south, selling them and uh, shipping them down the Mississippi River down into the deep south area. In Ellis County, I thought you might like to understand about how slavery was, was uh, done around here and how much it affected people. Actually, slaves made up about 20% of the population of this county in 1860, and about 20% of the white families owned at least one slave. So one-fifth of the people in the county were slaves, one-fifth of the white families in the county were slave owners. Uh, these slaves are actually working in a cotton gin area. They're, they're not doing the actual ginning itself, but they are baling up the cotton. You can see the people over on the left of the uh, picture there. That is a cotton bale they are preparing. Cotton bales are a lot bigger than hay bales. I don't know whether you've seen them. They don't use the uh, baling too much anymore for cotton. You see these massive uh, things about the size of a semi-trailer covered with blue fabric now out in the fields. But uh, up until recently, they put cotton in bales that were uh, about the size these guys are working with here. Now, in 1860, we had a presidential election, of course. And what's going to happen then is you've got Lincoln and you've got three other candidates running for U.S. president. And these candidates, in many ways, are each going to be, be popular in only one particular region of the country. Lincoln's popular in the north and others are popular in other areas. Now, you find that uh, Lincoln at that time didn't really want to abolish slavery. In fact, he was on record as saying that he didn't plan to abolish slavery. Uh, he didn't necessarily like slavery, but uh, the people of the South were afraid that there would be some kind of action taken against slavery and there would be eventual abolition of slavery if Lincoln were elected. So the South was very much against Lincoln and they were very afraid when Lincoln did get elected. It, it worried them. So the states of the lower south, once Lincoln is elected president, are going to call, each one of them call a convention. Every state calls a convention to decide whether to stay in the United States, whether to stay in the Union or not. And I thought you might like to see how Texas voted on secession. So uh, I hope you guys can see past me here to the map. The uh, lighter the color of these Texas counties, 
That means the greater the vote to leave the United States, to secede from the Union. Where are the darker areas, those that didn't have very, very large numbers who wanted to leave the Union? Are they in the western areas? Are they out kind of on the frontier? I think you can see that they pretty much are. The darker areas there are areas where the people were not so interested in the idea of slavery. They didn't have very many slaves in those counties, if any. Instead, they were more interested in uh, what might happen if U.S. government troops were withdrawn if the, if the state seceded from the Union. Who were they afraid of out in the darker counties? The, the Indians, right. Uh, those are the counties out on the frontier line. So Texas voted overall to secede from the Union, as did several other southern states. And the South began arming for war because Lincoln made it clear that he wasn't going to let these states go uh, peaceably. He was going to use force to keep them in the Union. So in Ellis County... What happened for the people right here was that they started recruiting troops for the Confederate Army. They started recruiting a cavalry regiment in Ellis County and the surrounding counties, and first of all, it was going to be used for frontier service. That is, it was going to be used uh, for Indian protection, but that uh, changed very quickly before the regiment was even fully recruited and they decided to put it in the regular Confederate Army. At first it was going to be basically a, a self-defense force for the frontier. But they changed that, they decided to put it actually in the regular Confederate Army and Ellis County is going to um, furnish about 300 men, about three companies for that regiment. The three companies, uh, they were given nicknames. They were called the Ellis County Blues, the Ellis County Grays, and the Rangers. And they all became part of this regiment, which at first included about 1,200 men. If you remember the other day, uh, when David Onion was speaking on Tuesday, he was talking about uh, paper strength for a regiment and actual strength 1,200 men was the paper strength of this original regiment. It didn't stay at that uh, level for very long after people started getting sick, after there uh, uh, started to be battles and people were killed and injured. And so uh, that 1,200 men was only the strength of this regiment at the very first. But 300 of them, about a fourth of them, were from Ellis County. In addition, we're going to find that... Uh, some other Ellis County men, another 200 men or so are going to go in another regiment a little bit later. The men are going to supply their own horses. The men are going to supply their own weapons. Why would you think that this turned out to be a cavalry regiment rather than a regiment of foot soldiers? Any reasons you can think of for that? Well, Texas is a little more open, a little more uh, horse country, maybe, because we had been settled uh, a shorter period of time than areas further east. So lots of people were still mounted. They all rode horses in this area, so it was kind of natural to form a cavalry regiment rather than a regiment of infantry or foot soldiers. The unit took the name of the man that they chose as their commanding officer. Now, in these Civil War units, oftentimes they would elect their own officers. And they elected a man named W.H. Parsons. I think it's kind of uh, interesting that Parsons had, had come from uh, the North, actually. Uh, I'd say it's rather ironic, in fact, uh, to know that Parsons was a native of New Jersey. However, he had been moved. Uh, his family went down to the South during the time he was just a kid. So he grew up in the South. But it's funny, I think, that uh, he was uh, a native of one of the northeastern states. Now, they had their initial training at a place called Rocket Springs. Uh, you know the little town of Rocket? If you go out uh, Highway 813, 
uh, which is Brown Street in town. If you follow that out past the seventh grade school, uh, probably about six or seven miles out in that direction, you have a little town called Rocket. And Rocket Springs Camp for Parsons, Texas Cavalry was right in that area, right on the banks of that creek that you see. And um, it's a, an, an interesting site. I have been uh, kind of toying with the idea over the past 10 or 15 years of seeing if we could possibly try to do a little bit of archaeological work out there because there's bound to be some stuff out there left from that time period, even though the troops were only there for a matter of a number of weeks. But uh, I haven't really gone beyond the thinking about it stage on that. The unit went down to Houston area for further training, and eventually they went on up into Arkansas. Um, excuse me. <laughs> they're going to serve not only in Arkansas, they're going to serve some in uh, Louisiana, some in Mississippi, and uh, they're never going to get over to uh, Robert E. Lee's forces in Virginia. They're never going to get over to the Atlanta area or anything like that. They're going to be serving solely in what we call the Trans-Mississippi Theater, which is west of the Mississippi River. Hit the off button, guys. Now we've talked a little bit about the Army. Let's talk about what it was like here in Ellis County itself during the war for the people who are left behind here. Ellis County had about 4,000 people, um, non-slaves I mean, in the county and about 1,000 slaves. And they sent about 500 men into the Army. So you can see it's a pretty large proportion of people going into the Army um, out of 5,000 people, they sent 500. So what do we have on campus here? If we have 1,000 students on campus, let's say for a round figure, well, we, we would uh, send about 100 of those 1,000 to the Army. Pretty large percentage, much larger percentage of people in the military than what we see today in our Army. With that many men gone, we're going to have to have to use the women for a lot of the work that's done. And in fact, the women are going to support the troops uh, quite a lot by making their clothing and supplies and basically holding down the home front. Now, one thing that happened in Ellis County that was of pretty great interest as far as the war effort goes is the manufacture of gunpowder for the Confederate government. There were a couple of gunpowder mills in Texas, one of them in Ellis County, one of them I think in the town of Marshall in East Texas. In Ellis County, uh, they erected a pretty substantial uh, gunpowder mill. Now it consisted of a number of different buildings, sheds, and pieces of equipment. Uh, a man named William Rowan, another person from the north, in fact, as you notice, William Rowan from Ohio is going to establish this gunpowder mill in Ellis County. It's going to be powered by mules. They, they hooked up 10 mules to uh, a kind of a turnstile mechanism that provided the power for the machinery that they used in the uh, gunpowder mill. It was pretty simple machinery, really. If you want to see where this is, you can go down near the First Baptist Church, not too far from the town square. This was on Rogers Street. And you will also uh, note down there, if you look closely enough, that there's a historical marker that shows the approximate site of the gunpowder mill. Well, this gunpowder was going to be used uh, for the Confederate Army. Uh, Mr. Rowan had a, a kind of un unique arrangement. I don't know whether any of the younger people in here know what this means, but um, have you ever heard of, of producing something on halves? Uh, a lot of times with farms, uh, like a, a place where you can go and pick berries or pick fruit or something like that, they'll let you pick on halves. You go and, and do the picking on this farm, and they'll let you keep half of it, and you give them half of it 
uh, as your payment for the fruit. Well, he had a similar arrangement with the Confederate government. Uh, all the gunpowder he made, he had to give half of it to the Confederate uh, government, and he got to keep the remainder and dispose of it, sell it as he wanted to, and make his profit from there. He had about 10 people total uh, working on and off at the mill, but a lot of times you didn't have nearly that many at one time. Finally, <laughs> we had some real problems. The gunpowder mill just blew up one day. Uh, this is April 29th of 1863 that this happened. Um, when the explosion occurred, we had Rowan and two other employees still there. And Rowan and one of the, one of the other employees, were uh, they were badly burned, and they jumped into a well after this explosion, or while part of it was still going on, because it was kind of a series of explosions. And they ended up dying. Uh, they died either that day or uh, one of them lingered till the next morning. They were, they were just burned completely all over their bodies. Now, a third man was also burned. In fact, uh, his clothes were actually burned right off of him. But he managed to survive. He managed even to recover. Now, what caused it? That was a big mystery, and uh, before long, people were talking about, well, there was this guy that we had not never seen before, and he was uh, hanging around town, and we saw him out by the gunpowder mill. He did it, and he must be from the north. Well, this is kind of the, the standard idea that the people of Ellis County, the people of Waxahachie decided on, but probably it wasn't anything quite that mysterious. Probably uh, one of the employees who was a fairly new man just didn't realize how careful you had to be around gunpowder. Hitting a couple of pieces of metal together when you're moving something can create a spark. And this gunpowder is in the air. It's permeating their clothing. So that is probably the, the reason for the explosion. It's just highly volatile and uh, caused great tragedy, of course. Now, what about uh, getting back to this Parsons Cavalry Unit? It uh, grew to the size of a brigade eventually, which is larger than a regiment. I just wanted to sum up things as far as their military actions for you. They fought about 50 military actions. Now, some of them were little skirmishes. Some of them were larger-scale battles. But uh, these battles stretched all the way over the course of the Civil War from 1861 to 1865. Most of the time, they're going to be involved in typical cavalry activity. They're raiding uh, northern supply lines. They're scouting for the main armies. They're doing outpost duty. That is, they're guarding areas uh, from sudden attack. But they didn't earn the reputation for being one of the very best cavalry units in the entire Trans-Mississippi area. So uh, they were very proud of that. I wanted to end up showing you a couple of, of monuments. Uh, there is a third one I'll point out to you in just a second. A couple of monuments uh, to the soldiers in the Civil War. The one on the left is at the county courthouse. You can see this if you go down there. This is basically a war memorial to the Confederate troops from Ellis County who fought in the war. Many of them died or were wounded. And then over on the right, I think you may be able to make out the words Confederate Powder Mill. You can see this um, historical marker. If you'll go down by the telephone company, which is a couple of, of blocks uh, this side of the town square and it will give you a little more information on the powder mill, which was right down there. Of course, there's nothing left of the powder mill now, obviously. And there is one more historical marker I'll point you to. Uh, if you were to go on Highway 77, go north toward Red Oak, but right before Highway 342 branches off to the right. Um, if you know where the, the big yellow pawn shop is that's on uh, 77, right at, at Highway 35. That is very close to this historical marker. And you can read a little bit about uh, Parsons Cavalry and their training at Rocket Springs. 
That is about all I have for you as far as Ellis County goes.